Hi everyone, my name is Charlie. I come to you today covered in dog hair with the possibility of the neighbour's dogs barking in the background to bring you my October wrap up. Now, October is synonymous with Victober for me and Victober is a month long read along hosted by Katie of Books and Things, Kate Howe and Lucy the Reader in which we all come together and celebrate Victorian literature. There were prompts and I promptly did not follow them. And I've read a few books. There were some hits, there were some misses. Uh, there were a few vlogs in which I discussed this. And that is why I think I'll limit how much I talk about these first two books. Firstly, we have Dr Thorne by Anthony Trollope. This is the third in the Barsetshire series. Before the events of this novel take place, although we're told within the first two chapters, Dr Thorne's brother sexually assaulted a woman who became pregnant and her brother went and nobbled Dr Thorne's brother and this kind of sets up where this novel's going to go. Mary Thorne, Dr Thorne's niece, ends up being brought up by him and they, through his work, she ends up brought up alongside this rich family, the son of which, Frank Gresham, is her love interest only his family looked down upon her due to her status. The scandal surrounding her birth is not known about. <sighs> but the reader is aware that this scandal, whilst unknown to the characters, could see society looking down upon Mary Thorne more than they already do. And it does have this big discussion about class and intermarrying and the beliefs of how to keep the blood clean. Honestly, whilst I found... I, I, thought this book was fantastic. It had that parochial sense that I talk about when I listen to The Archers. It reminded me of that. Um, it is incredibly predictable, so predictable in fact that Anthony Trollope actually mocks himself for the predictability of it. However, there is a section in the middle of about 150 pages that I do feel could have been removed. And also, I want justice for Mary Thorne still. I still just think the resolution of this story Whilst I knew it was coming and it should show the strength of Mary's character, I had hoped that she'd basically say to them all, Sod you all, you've looked down on me, you've talked badly about me, I'm off. So you can guess that that's not what happens. But still, very interesting, made me want to continue reading Anthony Trollope, which has been the case with each subsequent book I've read in this series, and I'm hoping to get to Family Parsonage this month. I will also leave a link to these vlogs in the description. Next we have The Woman in White. The less said about this book the better. It started off really well and I was engaged with this work but we are now two out of three books by Wilkie Collins that I have not enjoyed and I had high hopes for this one because it was one of the more famous ones and so many people loved it. I however found it tedious and boring and bloated and too long. It tries very hard to be scandalous does this book and I just I, I didn't enjoy the reading experience with this one not after the page 100 mark. After reading The Woman in White I felt as though I needed a break from Victorian literature. I'd only read two books in two weeks at this point however I had had overtime at work so I chose to read The Sister Who Ate Her Brothers and Other Gruesome Tales by Jen Campbell. We all know Jen has a YouTube channel and I had wanted to read this because I thought Halloween it's going to be dark and gruesome. And it was. There are some exceptional tales in here that I very much look forward to sharing with my nephew because I think they are the right kind of gruesome for a, well, how old is he? He's seven, he's going to be eight in February and I think that he will very much enjoy this. Indeed, there were stories within here that even at my age I thought the gruesomeness within them brought a smile to my face and I would recommend it as a gift for any younger people in your life who might like being scared a bit. Then we have Mrs Death, Mrs Death by Selena Godden. Ooh, this book was a disappointment for me. So we have this character of Wolf who is narrating their experiences of meeting Mrs Death in a event that seems synonymous with the Grenfell Tower disaster of a few years ago. And from this tr tragedy, Wolf started being able to see Mrs Death and is telling of their experiences with death and grief. 
and within the first 20 pages I found this a bit hard hitting. Anyone who has been faced by death or grief will understand just what the character, the narrator and the author all blended into one here are trying to convey. And I was honestly thoroughly looking forward to recommending this to people up until something happened at the 150 page mark that really annoyed me. I could see, sorry Sally's just playing outside, I could see where this book was hoping to go and it was disappointing because it did that thing that I sometimes feel comes from a place of fear where the author doesn't want to lean into the fantastical elements and wants to find a realistic explanation for them and so heightens the realism by making it about a certain issue and when it that happens I often find that it cheapens the narrative for me and I just wish that the author had continued to lean into the fantastical elements to continue to tell their tale. Also another issue that I had here was that the book doesn't necessarily go anywhere. It begins rather well and I would say those first 150 pages are building towards something that I didn't necessarily understand where it was going to go. However, firstly the final 30 pages completely changed tone, made no sense to me why the author had made the decision to end the book in the fashion they ended it in, so it just kind of felt like a damp squib of an ending anyway. I honestly left this book feeling nothing more than disappointment because it just made out as though it was going to say something and that the story was going to go somewhere and it did none of that. It was just like here are words on the page and I am fed up with telling the story and so what I had started out incredibly promising just ended up being an incredible disappointment. Next I read Dracula by Bram Stoker and I mentioned how I came to acquire this copy of Dracula and my history with it in another video but I will say that I actually ended up enjoying this book more than I thought I would. I had been told by others that they had found it boring in the past and I thought I would feel the same way. I would read the physical copy and also listen to the audiobook that was available through Audible which was a full cast narration which I think was to this book's benefit. I didn't care for the narrator of Mina and so whenever she came on I would switch off and just go and read the portion in the book. This book was surprising to me in how explicit certain scenes were. I had thought due to the time in which this book was written that Dracula would have everything understated and we would learn what had happened to characters through suggestion and uh, double entendre. That didn't happen. They explicitly stated what was going to happen, well what had happened and yeah there's a lot of allegory and allusion in here and I thought it was a tiny bit superb. Now I, admittedly I do think in places it went on too long and if we want to talk about a bit of a disappointing ending I would say that the ending here was just a tiniest bit disappointing only for the fact that it felt too quick. Uh, there was a lot spent on the journey of getting to where these characters needed to go to try and put an end to Dracula's actions and then everything that happened seemed to happen too conveniently. And I would have preferred if the author had removed some of the unnecessary stuff about travel and gone straight in to tell us about these characters arriving and more of a battle because everything we've been told about Dracula, all of the mystery that had been built up and the danger about his character that was there and none of it comes to light and all gets seen by the reader in those final scenes and I found that a bit disappointing. Also I think there was a big preoccupation of making sure that the reader knew who was telling what part of the story, where they were in relation to the story and I think maybe it was the author trying to explain away why, why they were where they were and how we came to have a different narrator this time but that bit didn't really work. I felt as though maybe the male characters kind of all blended into one and when it comes to Mina Harker who we get told is a very smart woman 
there does seem to be this case for trying to turn her into a sort of damsel in distress type character when she's really just as knowledgeable and fit a character to take on Dracula as the men are and there's this whole thing of trying to protect her. On the one hand I think okay this shows a bit of Victorian ideology of the time, what they thought of women um, but this whole thing of them having different brains and smaller brains that wouldn't be able to cope wasn't really something that I cared to read. But Dracula is now read and it remind the as I said in this blog, there were scenes in here that reminded me of why I ended up being terrified of vampires when I was a child. And so that was a brilliant moment of nostalgia for me. And probably be a few years before I go back and try and read Dracula again. Afterwards going and reading more about the context behind it and the history of this in the culture of the last hundred years. More fascinating than I did the book, if that makes any sense. However, having read Dracula, I chose to read Shadow Play by Joseph O'Connor. Earlier this year, I always knew I was going to pair these books together because this follows Bram Stoker at the time of him writing Dracula and is set in the um, Victorian era. Following Bram Stoker, Henry Irving and Alan... Oh, what's the name now? I knew a name. Alan Terry. I thought it was Alan Terry, but for some reason I wanted to say Taylor. Anyway, this book is dark and gothic and pleasantly Victorian. Firstly, I'm going to say go and watch Roz of Scally Dandling about the book's latest video, which she will give you some context surrounding Bram Stoker. I will try and do the same here with a potted history. Bram Stoker, at the time of living, was not famously known as a writer. He was known famously as being the manager of the Lyceum Theatre. This book begins with him having written a review of one of Henry Irving's works and Henry Irving, a celebrated actor of the time, choosing to employ Bram Stoker as the manager. It then goes to show the arguments and this almost tr love triangle between Henry Irving, Alan Terry and Bram Stoker, despite the fact that Bram Stoker was married at the time to a woman who kept trying to convince him to copyright the works he was putting out and he never would and they were getting plagiarised across Europe at the time. You get a big sense of um, the Bram Stoker's struggle with his sexuality in this book, which whilst we don't know was an actual fact, there are a lot of English literature folk and people who've looked back at his life who do believe that, theorise that Bram Stoker was bisexual, if not homosexual, and similar to Oscar Wilde has entered into a marriage of convenience with his wife. Oscar Wilde turns up in here and it does have discussions of sexuality at the time and how they were hidden uh, and it also gives you notice of the police of the time because they are investigating Jack the Ripper. It talks about how the theatre was maligned by society and women who worked in the theatre were seen as being little better than sex workers. Again, the atmosphere that the author managed to convey was brilliant. It goes between, it has three different timelines really. Before they go to open the Lyceum Theatre, whilst they're in the midst of all of the goings on there, Stoker is writing Dracula. There is supposedly a ghost haunting the Lyceum Theatre, and there are characters who have names that directly come up in Dracula so it was nice to see the links and had I read more Stoker apparently there are more allusions to other works within here that I will have missed. The final part goes back to where we were at the prologue following Stoker after the climax um, when something has occurred and oh, if you didn't know from the way I'm enthused about this book I did actually particularly enjoy this one. It was perfect for reading in the autumn months. I think if you are a fan of Diane Setterfield then you will like this due to the intertextuality used here and I also thoroughly enjoyed learning more about these characters from Victorian times that I hadn't known about. Uh, all I'll say is if you can find a copy that hasn't got the Richard and Judy stuff in then good for you because they made me very much annoyed when they um, seem to not realise that homosexuality had existed before the 1950s 
but whatever, whatever Richard and Judy. And then we're going to move on to Sylvia's Lovers by Elizabeth Gaskell, a book that has haunted me for a year. I bought this book on recommendation from Kate Howe last year for last year's October. I read 250 pages and then put it down. There were times in my reading last year where I thought it was really good writing and I was racing through it and there were other times when I was wondering what I had been recommended. However, if I'd continued to read after that 250 page mark, the pace picks up very rapidly indeed and tons and tons of stuff goes on in Sylvia's life that I just ended up feeling sorry for her. It was as though Elizabeth Gaskell, as as I said in my wool gathering video, it was as though Elizabeth Gaskell was channeling her inner Thomas Hardy. If you've ever read or seen a Catherine Cookson adaptation, it was like Catherine Cookson as well. Anything that could go wrong for this poor girl was going wrong. And I mentioned Tess of the Durbervilles when I was talking about this book because of a particular scene just after the 250 page mark. So what have we got here? Sylvia's Lovers is set in Monkshaven, a fictionalised version of Whitby. And Sylvia's cousin fancies her, but Sylvia fancies Kinraid. Well, stuff goes on, stuff goes on. Um, one of the lovers thinks he's got some over the other one, and Sylvia ends up moving from this rather reckless, feral rebel of a girl, and... It shows really her loss of that spark as more and more of a life takes its toll on her until we get to the end of the book. And by the end of the book, I was just pleased to see it over because quite frankly, I don't think this poor woman could have dealt with any more. Especially at one point when it said she was 21 and I was like, are you kidding me? 21? 21? 21 and you're putting through all this. I mean, I know it was the Victorian times and life was hard, but even I felt sorry for her then. And I don't tend to do that often. I think also with Sylvia's lovers, I could very much see how inspired she was by the Brontes, specifically towards the end by Charlotte Bronte and Jane Eyre with something that happened to one person. And I didn't particularly care for the end of this book, which really just shows the general consensus for October, doesn't it? I did not care for the endings of any of these books, apart from Jen Campbell's. But that was a short story collection, really, and it ends on a particularly good story. <sighs> but here, uh, I think that the ending is suitable for the values of the time but as a reader I wasn't particularly fond of it. It's very good in terms of the morals and if we think about this contextually it makes perfect sense. It just isn't the ending that I wanted so it's my own readerly thing really. Other readers will probably really like the ending because it'll be Victorian moralistic and romantic but I'm not Victorian my morals lie elsewhere and I have different opinions I was thinking of these characters like real people I suppose so maybe that's an issue thinking about them as set pieces and the overall tone of this novel it makes perfect sense as to why Gaskell would do what she did but I just, I did not care for the treatment of Sylvia in this book. That's all I can say. And apparently, the only time I'm going to see any humour from Gaskell was in Cranford. So I've got to get used to the idea of her being incredibly horrible to her characters, I expect. Can anyone let me know that? Is Elizabeth Gaskell generally going to be mean to her characters? Are they going to go through some horrible things that I disagree with? Moralistically? Realistically? let me know. Anyway, them's the books. If you have read any of these books and would like to discuss them, then please feel free to do so in the comments. I hope that you have enjoyed this video, and until next time, that is all.